walking you through the sound system that we have here at my church, Christ Triumphant, here in Lee Summit, Missouri, and kind of giving you an idea of what we might choose to upgrade and kind of the decisions that might go behind that, where we're at with our system, and maybe it's like some of the stuff that you've got in your system. So go ahead and say hi in the chat if you're watching. Uh, I'll try to get to any questions you have as we go. And we're starting here in the sound booth, and we've got an X32. Um, pretty standard. We're running the latest version of firmware. We also have on the computer a uh, live performer, is that, or live professor, excuse me. Um, so we're running live professor for vocal tuning because that just helps clean up the live stream and makes it uh, a whole lot easier to listen to. Uh, the singers aren't bad here, but any pitch issues that happen online uh, just amplifies them and it makes it like puts them under a microscope where they sound great in here and they're crushing it. But that pitch correction just makes it a lot easier for people to uh, jump in online. So, hey, Randy. Hey, uh, Ibawoye. Uh, hopefully I said that right, or Michael, haha, <laughs> that's an easier name to say. Uh, thanks for checking in on the chat, glad to have you guys here. So we're running the X32, we're running uh, Live Professor for Waves Tune Real Time, and we're just doing that on the vocals. Uh, so we're not doing a bunch of other processing, and the Mac Mini right here is handling um, all the processing power. So we're running, I think, at about uh, 512 for our buffer rate and it's handling it brilliantly. So we don't have a ton of latency and it's working really well. Uh, I'm really happy with that. Uh, if you'll walk with me around the room a little bit, um, one of the weaknesses that we have here in this room is that our speakers are mismatched. So let me turn this around for you guys and hopefully you can see. Uh, there we've got a speaker over here. That's a JBL something. Over here is a Meyer speaker. Uh, they're not matched. And I've matched the tone pretty well with some EQ that I put. Uh, I put our stereo bus on a matrix uh, so that I could EQ each side independently. And so then, uh, you know, the, the side over there was a lot brighter than the side over here. So, you know, with a little bit of EQ and a high shelf, I kind of matched those. I didn't bust out smart. I didn't get out any measuring tools. I just kind of listened with my ears and kind of fine-tuned it uh, for me, you know, and it works well enough. You know, we're not having to get super scientific because we've got a room of 100 people in here, right? So it's not a huge church. Uh, but that's one of the weaknesses that we have is that our speakers are mismatched. The other thing is uh, some of the, uh, the way that the angle on the speakers is is a little bit different. So this one is angled a little bit more out uh, toward the back. And this one, or sorry, this one's angled a little bit more toward the back. This one's angled out a little bit more, or a little down a little farther. So if we come up here to the front of the room, uh, and of course this is where the pastor sits. He sits right here, and if I can try to see where the speaker is. Come on, phone thingy. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't want to let me do that. Uh, the speaker right here, the high frequencies don't reach down here where the pastor sits. So sometimes if the sound tech is not running it loud enough, uh, it's more apparent right here because he's missing a lot of that top end coverage. Um, over here on this side, if our pastor decided to change spots and go on the other side to sit and he sat here, it would be quite a bit brighter just based on the, the slight angle difference of those speakers. So that's one thing that we could upgrade and we probably should upgrade. It's just a matter of budget and timing, which is, you know, everything there. Um, let me check the chat real good. All right, so I'm gonna show all messages. Hey, all right, so uh, Patrick's asking, is the Mac mini Intel or M1 and memory size? I think we just, get, we got the M1, uh, but we got the, um, I think we just got the basic one. So we didn't upgrade the memory on that one and it's running fine. I don't think that the live processing for vocal tuning is really RAM dependent, although I could be wrong. Maybe you could get more out of it, but for our four vocal channels that we have, it's working fine and handling things beautifully. We haven't had any dropouts or clicks and pops and things like that. Um, so on stage, let's take a look around and see what we've got here. Things we could upgrade and put money into. So up in the drum booth, we've got a nice drum booth. Uh, my friend Terry built this one from before I was involved in the church. Um, 
but our drum booth is great. One of the weaknesses in here is our snare drum. The snare drum mount is uh, attached to the drum. And so while I usually like my snare drum, I'm sorry if this is dark for y'all. I like my snare drum mic pointed more across the drum. This, as the drummer hits it, this tends to wiggle up and point straight down at the head, which is not my preferred uh, way of doing it. So, you know, a mic stand is uh, on the one of the budget requests. Um, we need some more acoustic treatment on the back of here. This was put together because this booth used to be up against the back wall, but then we got our new rear projection screen. And so that, uh, we, you know, they threw up this wall and then forgot to put the uh, acoustic treatment uh, installed into the wall itself. So we've got to get some panels for that. That's uh, one other place where we could upgrade. On stage, um, this is an issue for some of you that have a, uh, a system where it wasn't, it was, might, might have been just kind of cobbled together. Uh, if we look down at the stage boxes, this is a big thing, is the wiring is a big deal. And this is messy because somebody shoved all the excess in here. But if I turn this right, okay, I think you can see that. You can see this is box F and it's got labeled, you know, four through F8, you know, F1 through four and F1 through eight. So then on the other end, uh, forgive me, Cyprian, for I messed up all those cables. Oh, here we go. Um, on the other end, we've got our snake head that's stuck under the stage. And that's a big mess, but everything's labeled over there. And labeling is your friend, especially with patching stuff. If a cable stops working, you want to have the patch ability to be able to, uh, to see all that. So... Um, so you want to be able to figure stuff out, especially if you're adding inputs or if you're doing something new, you really want to be able to have those, um, those available and labeled really well. Labeling is your friend, right? Because that can help you get your input list dialed in. That can make sure that everything's working well there. Um, one other thing that's kind of a weakness here that we need to put money into, but it's, um, it's tricky. Um, because just because of budget uh, is the wireless stuff. Our pastor's wireless mic is, we've got the receiver over here on stage so that we don't have any dropouts. So, oh, my gimbal messed up. Please forgive me. So here we've got his wireless receiver and an extra Bible because you can't have too many Bibles. Um, but the rest of our wireless mics, we've recently added more wireless stuff so that we can like move the worship leader off stage all of a sudden. So uh, after worship, right, our, wor our singers can take their whole mic stand, pick it up and move it, and they're not having to wrangle cables out of the way to get it so that the worship leader or the worship or the lead pastor can bring his teaching pulpit up or the table really. And it's got its little uh, marker for where it goes. It just makes those transitions easier and cleaner, makes the stage look nicer. The problem is, let me hop off the stage here, which I'm not supposed to do technically, but um, it's, it's there. The problem is that all of our wireless units are kind of on the lower end. So you can see here, uh, <laughs> so we've got this Sure unit, the PGXD4 digital, right? But there's no way to upgrade the antennas on here, right? The antennas are these little short guys. And if you have any dropouts, you're toast, right? So uh, another Sure unit, this is the BLX88. Uh, and they've been working okay, but every once in a while there will be wireless dropouts and there's no way to add an extra antenna or an external antenna. Same thing for this last one. I think this one is for our announce mic. That's the PGX4, right? Just these little built-in antennas. So that's one of the weaknesses of, and why I recommend people uh, spend a little bit more money on your wireless gear is because eventually you might need to upgrade your antennas. Uh, with more 5G cell phones coming in uh, and online for people, uh, that raises the wireless noise floor that we have to get up above in order to get a great wireless signal. So when it comes time where these aren't working anymore or these aren't giving enough signal, we've got two options. We can move them up on stage and even moving them up on stage could get them up to four feet apart from one another, which helps 
them not interact and create more interference problems. Uh, it also shortens the distance between where the mic is and where the receiver is, so that's another good thing. Um, but beyond that, we don't have any options to upgrade to, say, uh, an antenna combiner or distribution. I always forget which one is which. I think it's distribution for the microphone side and a combiner for the in-ear monitor side. Uh, but if I'm wrong, you can correct me in the comments. Um, so that's one of the weaknesses that we have here in our system and one of the things that we would need to upgrade, and, but it would be pretty costly to do that. It would probably be in the realm of $600 to $1,000 a channel, especially if we got the, you know, the antenna system to go along with it. We're not just buying the units themselves. So that's an expensive thing that could be, uh, that could be upgraded, uh, but again, it's, it's not causing problems immediately, but uh, the church leadership team needs to know about it. And that's kind of why I came on here, is knowing what might need to be upgraded is pretty important so that your leadership team and your budget team knows what might be coming down the pike, right? If you can foresee, hey, this wireless mic isn't gonna work forever, and it might either become obsolete, where maybe the FCC decides, you know, this is forbidden frequency anymore, or it might just be that, you know, the, the 5G cell phones crowd out all the frequency spectrum that that can use. And then, so, you, you know, having the plan B of moving them on stage is one thing, but eventually, if you want to stay wireless, you're just going to have to spend a bunch of money. And it's unfortunate, and I know church money is tight, but that's kind of the way things are. If you want things to be working and reliable, you cannot have an unreliable worship leader's mic, and you cannot have an unreliable preacher's mic. That's just, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Think about all the hours of preparation your pastor took to prepare that message. You're gonna let a few hundred dollars difference of microphone quality and wireless transmitter quality affect the way that anybody can listen to that because they're distracted by dropouts. That's you know, not something you wanna mess with. So uh, I highly recommend spending the money and going for it when you're doing wireless stuff, budget, $600 to $1,000 per channel that you need. And that's just gonna be the cost, or go wired, which is way cheaper and way more reliable and doesn't have battery costs associated with it as well. That's why I'm just a huge fan of wired. Uh, I just like it, but I know uh, the aesthetic part really matters to some people. Um, so those are some of the things that we could upgrade here. Um, I see some of the stuff in the comments about kind of our time alignment and our subs. So these subs are theater subs. So I think they came out of a movie theater. And they're, um, I mean, they're not great. They're not going to move a ton of air, but they kind of get the job done-ish. Our congregation is a lot of um, young families. Uh, so to have the, the need to like push and move a lot of air is not super essential for us, right? Nobody's really disappointed if the kick drum doesn't thump them. And if they are, they kind of realize that there's enough people around them that don't care about that as much, so they're, they're cool with it, right? I always want to crank more low end, and I want to have the horsepower to really go there if I really want to make it crush. Uh, but that's really not a critical part for our demographic and who we're serving uh, at our congregation in Lee Summit. You know, it's suburban, lots of, you know, young families. So, yeah, if we had a younger congregation and we, you know, there was many more uh, young adults, college-aged, um, you know, students, stuff like that, then yeah, maybe, you know, upgrading the subs would be more important. Uh, let me see if I can find it over here. It's in a rack underneath, but the, somebody was asking about time aligning the subs to the tops. Uh, that's done with this DBX, uh, what's the, no Drive Rack PA. So it's got the inputs and outputs there, and all that is in menus and layers. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. So I haven't messed with that because my good friend Terry is the one that uh, set this up, and he did all the menu diving to figure all that out and got it set up. So uh, I'm trusting his judgment on that, even though I had to add a little bit more EQ for this speaker over here. Uh, because they changed it after he moved that. So there's a light flickering right over me, I gotta move. Um, 
So that's how you go about time aligning. Really, you, when you think about the process of time aligning, um, we, you know, you've got to think about from this point here, let me see if I can get it in frame. From this point here, well, that's the further one. Here we go. From this point here, it's one distance to the subs, it's another distance to the tops, right? So the one that's closer, we actually have to add delay to that one because the other one will be arriving after because uh, audio signals travel at about the speed of light, but sound travels at about 1130 feet per second or 1.1 feet per second. Yeah. Um, so, or per millisecond, excuse me, 1.1 feet per millisecond. So if the subs are closer to me than the tops are, then I'm gonna delay my tops a little bit to make sure that those waves are arriving here at the same point. The problem with that is that the, the distance difference of that triangle between me, the tops, and the subs changes when I move closer. And really the main problem that happens when you're time aligning subs and tops uh, only occurs at the crossover frequency. So uh, the difference on when the subs arrive here and the tops arrive here, that really matters most at that point which we crossed over our speaker. So if their crossover point is at 80 hertz, we're gonna get the most difference between uh, the way that we time align it here and up there at 80 hertz or at that one frequency. Now, low frequencies are mysterious and hard to control, and especially in an acoustic environment like this, or really any indoor acoustic environment, there are so many things happening with low frequencies. The low frequencies are bouncing off that wall. They're bouncing off the back wall over here. They're bouncing off the side walls, and they're resonating between the floor and the ceiling. They're taking into account all those different boundaries and, they're cha and because of that, that makes the way that those low frequencies combine at any one spot for any one frequency unpredictable unless you do a whole lot of acoustic treatment in the low frequencies. And yes, I've been in uh, uh, performing arts centers where they've done that amazing and it's awesome and you're up against the back wall but you're not getting a big bass boost and all these different things. So you can worry a lot about the tops and the subs being time aligned, or you can just try to get it as even as you can because uh, you're really facing an uphill battle when it comes to that. So that's kind of the, my you know, working theory on time aligning tops and subs is sometimes it matters a whole lot more than others. And here, I mean, our, our subs are so, I don't wanna say wimpy, but they're wimpy that it's not making a huge difference and it's really not like making a huge difference at that, uh, at that level. Uh, I saw another question in the comments, hang on. Um, so do I prefer subs on the ground or subs flown? Um, subs flown can be a good option, especially if that creates a single like unit with the top speakers um, especially in like line arrays or even some compact line arrays, then everything is happening from the same point in time and space, right? So the crossover points get a lot more easy or a lot easier to, uh, to deal with because they're all coming from one point in the system. The problem that happens with that is say you've got a big... Um, amphitheater type seating, right? So it's going up at an angle in the back of the room. Then those subs that are up high are going to bounce and it's gonna become like a mirror off the floor and there's gonna be a timing difference between what happens from the speaker and the sub straight to the audience and what bounces off the ground and then to the audience. So flying subs can create more challenges and it can fix different things. So the other thing that you get with subs on the ground is that you get uh, boundary interference, which actually causes a boost in energy. So you actually get a few more dB out of your subs that are on the ground than when they're flown or in an open, uh, open space and don't have any boundaries on the either side. 
Do either of those make a giant difference to me in most situations? Not really. Um, I'd say go with what's easiest and what fits with the rest of your speaker system, right? So let's say you got a line array and they've got an option for a sub that's part of the line array itself. Do it, right? Just put it in there. Maybe you have additional subs on that that are not flown. Uh, because of all the acoustic anomalies that happen, I'm not really that worried about what happens with my subs. Um, even though that sounds like, I mean, that's contradictory to it's all about the low end, right? But at the same time, you have to try to get that right, not necessarily absolutely perfect. Now in a studio environment, you're going to have to, like say you're mixing in a broadcast room and you've got a sub for your uh, broadcast setup. That becomes trickier because you are trying to get it perfect because the more clearly you can hear the low end in that situation, the more your low end is gonna translate between different speaker systems that you're listening to. So all that to say, subs in a live sound situation, get them the best that you can, but don't fuss too much about it. It's only really gonna affect the crossover frequency. If you can fly them, make sure that your audience is all on the same plane, or basically everybody's on the ground. If you're going to, if you've got a, like amphitheater style seating or a balcony, you want to tend to not fly the subs because then the ground becomes a mirror and then that phase cancels the energy up in the upper balconies. Um, as with most of my advice, these are generalities, so don't take it as dogma and if you find an article on like ProSound Web or something that contradicts what I'm saying, awesome. Probably go with that one because this is not technically edited, this is live. Uh, so, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But those are things that I think about when I'm thinking about subs and getting the most mileage out of them. Uh, I got a couple more questions coming up in the chat and the fly. Uh, whew, fly's getting me, that's bad. Um, yes, I have a beard. I have to check in every once in a while to see how much gray I've got. I don't know how long I'll keep it. Um, where do I have the gaffer's tape? It's in a drawer. Um, Dio Soto from Brazil. What's up, man? Um, Afim from Russia. Good to have you here. Man, the internet is weird because I'm in Lee Summit, Missouri, in the middle of the United States of America, and people from all around the world are tuning in. So, Super thankful to have you guys here. Thank you for serving in your church or with your band in the club, whatever you're doing. Uh, I'm glad you tuned in. Uh, so that's going to be it for me for today. Hopefully this gives you guys some ideas of what to upgrade and some of my thoughts on subs, which I wasn't planning on talking about, but that's what we get when we do live video. I'm here for you guys. Remember, uh, hit subscribe and ding the little bell if you haven't already. Uh, tuning into these live situations is awesome. Uh, super pumped to have you guys here. So, you know, get the notifications because you want to be able to chat with me live and I can answer your questions. So hit that notification bell. Remember, it's all about the low end, like the shirt says, and you can find merch. I'll drop a link down in the description. Avoid the sound tech solo and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. Until next time, we'll see you later. Bye-bye.